to Katoa. Uh, thank you very much, Nikki. And um, I just want to disavow myself from the compliment of uh, having organised this because really I, I had a very minor role in harassing Nikki with my theory of change about a year ago. And um, so this is amazing um, for the organisation that I'm here. Uh, yeah, Steve Abel, I, um, I do work for Greenpeace now, and, but I, I started off activism with no forest action. Um, community campaigning group and um, work on the GE movement and then climate change campaign opposing Mars and Vehicle Fire Power Station in 2005 and uh, left Green Visual World to be a musician, which is what I've always been as well. And came back and helped organize the march up Queen Street in 2010 against mining and then got involved in the Stop Lips Your campaign, which is ongoing. It's a bit of a sort of part of the street mine. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with my first slide. Can I do that? Yeah. This is, I actually found this, I didn't expect to use this, but I found this when I um, was doing the Google search for Subvert the Dominant Paradigm. I don't know why that image came up, but. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that made me reflect on is, um, in a dramatic way, characterize our culture as a culture of death. Uh, a militarist, consumerist, um, oppressive, you know, ecocidal society that we find ourselves in the world. And sometimes when we reflect on these things like patriarchy or oppression or, you know, you know effectively slavery that might make people live their lives and, and the things that are characterized in that story we just had, it can sometimes feel very overwhelming. And, um, and we can think, my God, how do we deal with this, uh, these gargantuan issues? Each of them kind of goliaths in themselves. Um, and so for me, it's, it's kind of attempting to answer that question, I think, is our, our great challenge. How do we uh, deal with this ferocious kind of beast, the moments that we see it on the hilltop poisoning us? And, and my, my, um, my belief, I should, I, should, I should go back to that, I shouldn't, I won't go back to that. But I'll, I'm going to give a quick summary before I crack into it. Um, I think we have to, to do that, we have to confront and subvert the underlying assumptions of that culture. Um, and in, the, in that, I believe we need to u utilize slingshot strategies to kill these Goliaths. Um, and they should be ambitious, but plausibly possible, not nobly futile. Um, and the challenge upon us is to actually find strategies that work, um, as David did when he killed Goliath. Um, and, and, the, and the most subversive thing, two, two elements of that subversion is one to criticise the establishment, and the second thing is to is to um, is to energise and imagine a different world that's possible. Um, and so, th these are the two elements I think are necessary. This amounts to the change of culture. To change culture, require movements that confront the establishment agendas, and through a binary framing, as I'll explain, um, present a values crisis. Um, and through that presentation of values crisis can mobilise people um, to challenge those establishment orders. Um, I believe these movements need to be steeped in moral integrity because that's the only thing that really works in terms of motivating people. Um, and they need to have real world battlegrounds. They can't be purely theoretical. Um, my essential uh, principle I believe in in terms of movements themselves is that without polarising you're going to mobilise. Now, I, this, thought, this whole theory came out of a question I was asked by somebody from Generation Zero in Wellington, which was, what makes a good campaigner? She said it's a short question. I said, I can't give a short answer. <laughs> but one of the things I was grappling with was um, a perception among some people that, that saying stop this or don't do this or protest this was negative campaigning. And I, I took real issue with it. So I tried to understand why it's an issue with that. Um, ultimately, after culture change, as I said, um, this for me is really wrong the values hierarchy of our society. Behaviour demonstrates values. Um, it's culture that builds a motorway through a rainforest to show what its values are. Um, I don't believe in progress, which is complex, so I can't explain it now, but um, change is constant, therefore no change is permanent. But I think the most pervasive kind of change is culture change. Um, and the definition of that is living values. For change, you must, by definition, confront the status quo and the establishment. It inherently relies on some sort of confrontation. I'll direct, I'll 
I'm still warning this situation. Um, um, I thought it was an interesting symbol of confrontation. You cannot challenge the status quo without being contentious. Um, this is Rosa Parks, who was arrested for sitting down on a white sunny bus. Um, so, my other premise is contention is essential to change. And I love this word contention because contention has two meanings. It means to disagree and it also means to take a position. I contend that. And so it's a great word because it captures both these ideas. It's taking a position and being prepared to be disagreeable. Um, my sort of theory is that um, of binary framing, which is to do with how you achieve the polarization. A house divided against itself can't stand. Um, this is from a speech by Abraham Lincoln in 1858 when he basically said that America will become all slave owning or all free. It cannot be both. He presented a binary framing, and, um, and it, it, that, was, that was his suggestion. Of course, the Southerners said, no, no, no we can be both. Um, and so the, th the key thing about the binary framing is that it is a position you take, you present this proposition. And of course what ensued after that was a, a ghastly civil war um, over this very issue. And the house ceased to be divided, if you like, at some level. Of course, we can still see in America this the racism, the basing, the basing this of racism. <laughs> so these struggles go for decades and centuries. Um, that's the essential principle. principle. I, so my, I'm essentially saying that in, in these successful movements, you've got this binary framing where two values are being pitted against each other in a society. Um, and for me, the reason this is so important is because this is how you get uh, the sort of stickability you need for there to be a movement and for people to actually contend with their cultural values at a profound level. So, when I reflected on this, I said, I started wondering with myself, what, what are the kind of value struggles that we know in movements in New Zealand? And I thought about the, uh, the Springbok tour, and I feel like it was essentially a value, a struggle between two values that we held highly in that hierarchy of cultural ideals. One was that we like to think of ourselves as a non-racist country. And we love rugby. And I myself am someone who's guilty of this as well. I'm ashamed to say my mother used to call it folk beat. But I do love rugby. And, and so this is actually a proper value struggle for us in New Zealand. And it was pre presented as a framing that if you're, if you're truly non-racist, then you must oppose the tour. And, if, and if, you're, if you're a racist, then you'll support the tour. Of course, this, the, the rugby union said, no, 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 no. It's, um, we're not racist, we just think politics shouldn't be in sport. So they always will disagree with your framing. But the framing played out in, in what was the, what Norm Kerr predicted in 1974 would be the largest civil uprising in New Zealand history. And, and indeed, I remember, I was only 11 years old, but um, I do remember the country was pretty divided, and the description of it was that pretty much everyone except John Key had an opinion on this. <laughs> they, they were either for the tour or against the tour. He's an exceptional man in that way. And, <laughs> and, um, and so, this is for me a good example of it. But for there to be such a level of contention is essential for us to actually reflect at a cultural level on, on what's at stake in these decisions. Another example, I think, is um, the nuclear free movement, another successful movement. Um, and for me, what, the, what, what were the, the binary struggle at a values level was a struggle essentially, if it can be summarized, between independent foreign, foreign policy, which says, fuck off America, and loyalty to our allies. Um, which would say, thank you, um, yeah, welcome American ships. Um, and again, this is, a, this is a properly contentious issue. For most people are going to go, yeah, you know, we've fought in a war with these guys, you know, in many wars, and like, we, have, we have got this history of loyalty. So this is a properly culturally contentious issue to actually tell America, no, we're not, not going to be friendly to you anymore. The people on the left thought, you know, for whom it was obvious that it's not, there's another characteristic about these things, which I think is important, is that in the framing, the, the primary proposition is highly moral. So, one of the things that Abraham Lincoln said in, in that speech he made about slavery in 1858 was, um, if we continue to have slavery, it will be the course of ultimate extinction, was the words he used. He had a very profound 
statement against slavery. And, and, and here, we, when we think about these other struggles against racism or against the, the, nu nuclear, the nuclear threat, you're actually taking a proposition that when seriously asked the question, do you choose between racism or rugby, there's only one really right answer, right, to, to, to everybody in society. And, and when presented with the proposition, do you choose between slavery or being free, there's only one really right answer for that. And, and I think this is why a morally framed uh, binary choice is so necessary for successful movements. Um, I made the classic error of putting my notes as a PowerPoint. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm a good amateur of PowerPoints. Yeah, you can read that if you want. <laughs> it has to be a public dissonance. Um, it, it has to be a, a choice that the whole country is making. So I think this, the, the challenge on us as a movement is actually to make sure that we, we frame things and issues in a way that are comprehensible enough that the whole country basically can be part of this con consideration. The choice must be clear, it must not be woolly, you know? Um, and, and nearly everyone has to have an opinion on it. You know, it creates a situation where you can't be offensive on this one. Are you for the tour or are you against the tour? And the people who are offensive will get mocked to their, to their graves, as John Key will. You know, you have to have a position on it. And that's what a good movement does, it forces us into this binary choice. Um, and that's how you change culture, because you give an ascendancy to the choice that was made. Well, that does work. Um, and in a way, I think movements are a little non-violent civil wars. I hope, no, hopefully not violent. This is one of my questions I have is maybe they can be violent, but I, I strongly I believe in non-violence. Um, where people take sides for a process. Um, moral struggle is really important. How's my time go? Oh my God. <laughs> two minutes. So it has to be a moral struggle because I've said already why it has to be a moral struggle. Um, <laughs> um, so this is the last thing I'll sort of have a chance to say, but framing should speak to existing or latent human cultural values that are potentially subversive to the dominant worldview. This is what, what I think the pathway to it is. We, we need to use positive cultural forms, values and traditions to challenge dominant cultural behaviours and assumptions. So for example, um, we, we, people, we live in an individualist society, but our framing should be based on a principle of community, not on a principle of individualism. So when we talk about rivers being polluted, we can say, you know, we're important to look after the river for everyone's sake, but the dairy industry is toxifying it and ruining it for, for everyone, just so a few can profit. For me, that's a, that's a subversive framing, because it says community values matter more than individual values or profit. And it's important that our framings are subversive of that dominant paradigm. Um, and this is why, Saving the climate is good for the economy is a terrible frame because it's not morally founded. It may actually be good for the economy, but that's actually irrelevant. It's not completely relevant. But there, is a, there is a moral basis to having a strong economy. Um, there you go, I think I've sort of done everything with it. Um, recap. For me, when Sun Tzu said, win the battle before you fight the battle, um, framing is where the battle is won. Essentially, if you have the right framing, you kind of can't lose, is what I suggest. Um, action is the moment of truth. You need to take direct action. And it just goes on and on. <laughs> um, my theory entails that successful movements, the thing I'm not sure about and asking the question, what's wrong with it, um, is that I'm not sure that you always need these contradictory values that are um, deeply held. Sure. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you.